Good evening, and welcome to our Thursday evening Bible study here at Crozet United Methodist Church. I'm Sarah, the pastor, and as we are working our way around and through the Bible, tonight we're going to do the shortest of the Old Testament books, and that is the prophetic book of Obadiah. Um, and so up here I've got written the shortest OT book, OT for Old Testament. Of course, if we were studying together with um, any of the other Abrahamic faiths, like our Judaic or our Islamic siblings in faith, then we wouldn't be using OT. I would have HB, Hebrew Bible up there. But we're here together, and I think it's okay for us to go with OT. But we're going to be talking about Obadiah. It has no chapters. It's only 21 verses. So it's something that you could definitely sit down and read. Unfortunately, this is actually one of the least read books of the Bible. And perhaps people have a tendency to think that short is inconsequential or not meaningful. However, that is not the case. And there's a lot of great theology, a lot of good things to ponder in the book of Obadiah. And we're going to get to pay attention to it this evening. So I'm going to erase this as we get there. This is, of course, immediately following the book of Amos, which we finished last week, and preceding the book of Jonah, which most people have at least heard of, <laughs> kind of know the story. So hopefully we'll finish Obadiah and we'll get to talk about that. But let's talk about Obadiah. So who is this Obadiah? Unfortunately, the book itself doesn't give us a lot of information. So one of the, the ways that we try to figure out who someone is in the scriptures is to see if they're somewhere else in the scriptures. Well, unfortunately, Obadiah was actually more of a common name than you might think it would be, although there are certainly pockets within the family of Christianity that still use this name. A lot of our um, Anabaptists, siblings in Christianity, like the Mennonites and the Amish, they still use the name Obadiah. But there are three places where there are specifically and meaningfully mentioning the name Obadiah. So first, Kings 18.3, there is an Obadiah who works in the palace of King Ahab. King Ahab is the monarch over the northern kingdom of Israel. He is not considered to be a good monarch. He is the one that is married to the infamous Jezebel. And this Ahab actually takes it upon himself to try to hide away some of the prophets of Yahweh and keep them safe because at that time Ahab and Jezebel were persecuting them and murdering the prophets of God. And so this Obadiah will hide them. And then he actually ends up running into Elijah, the prophet of God at that time in 1 Kings. So there's a little bit of a story there about an Obadiah. Then in 1 Chronicles, and so Chronicles is the, the, the Bible's using all of 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings and trying to condense it and give it a slight twist in 1 and 2 Chronicles. The hope was that the people of Israel thought that if you couldn't get through those big books, then maybe you could get through 1 and 2 Chronicles. So 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 21 lists an Obadiah as a descendant of David through his son Solomon. David actually had lots of children, but Solomon is the one who will follow him on the throne and will be the last monarch to rule over a united northern and southern kingdom in Israel. And so there's, a, there's an Obadiah there. Then there's Nehemiah, chapter 10, verse 5, and in there it mentions an Obadiah as a priest. So could it be one of these? We don't really have a definitive answer because when we look at when this book was written or when the prophet Obadiah was actually prophesying, it's, we don't even agree on that. Usually we can give you like a decade or two or at least like within this part of the century that we can try to narrow it down in. Unfortunately, we can't even agree on Obadiah. So some scholars believe that it could be as late as 900 um, BC. Uh, some believe that it could be closer to... Uh, 600 um, in that area because they believe that it's going to predate the Babylonian exile. Um, and so we will have an opportunity to kind of explore that. But one of the reasons that they do that is because in 587 BC, 
we get the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. So this is when Babylon will lay siege to Jerusalem and they will destroy the temple of God in order to take all of the gilding and all of the accoutrement that is part of the worship and take that back to Babylon with them as the spoils of war. So they will destroy that temple entirely. And in their conquest, and then in the years after, a neighboring nation called Edom will play a part in helping Babylon oppress and cause harm to the people of Israel. And our prophetic book is going to focus on what is going to happen to the Edomites. So let's talk about Edom in case you're not fully familiar with who they are. So again, my completely not to scale version of the promised land. <laughs> feel like I should just get it permanently engraved on a whiteboard. Okay, and up here, this is Israel. And then you've got Jerusalem here. And so, uh, again, this is, it's not a giant oval, but this makes it easier for us to draw repeatedly and quickly. So Judah in the south, Israel. Down here in this area, you have Edom. So you have Moab, Edom, you've got Philistia, the Philistines this way, um, Sidon will be up here, uh, headed that way. You will have Assyria, later on Babylon, Persia. So all of those will be up here. And Edom is a neighbor, but they're not just a neighbor. They are actually part of the lineage of the Israelites, which is something that sometimes we forget. They actually trace themselves back to Esau, let me go back over here for a second. They trace themselves to Esau. So if you'll remember, we have Abraham, who is our first patriarch, and he has Isaac. He also has Ishmael, but for the scriptures, we trace ourselves to Isaac. And then Isaac is going to have two sons. They are actually twins. And the first is Esau, and the second is Jacob. And Jacob is the one that will get renamed Israel, and then he is going to have 12 sons, and each of those sons will be the namesake and the, and the genetic founder of our 12 tribes of Israel. So that's where we get Jacob. And the Bible is, for the most part, going to follow this lineage. So at the, the genealogies that you see at the beginning of the books of Matthew and Luke in the New Testament that are tracing us to Jesus, uh, or to actually tracing Jesus back, are going to include this line back to Abraham. And Esau over here is actually going to lead to the people known as Edom. So while they have a common ancestor, actually they have two common ancestors here, they do not get along, and you can read about Esau and Jacob in Genesis, and they don't get along. And actually Jacob will supplant Esau. Esau was the first to emerge from the womb. He is the firstborn, and so technically he should have a birthright that includes a double portion of the inheritance. He should in inherit double of what his brother would get. And Esau actually ends up selling his birthright to Jacob. He comes in one day. Jacob, Esau used to be the pride of his father's eyes, and Jacob was the pride of his mother's eyes. And hanging out with his mother, Rebecca, all the time, Jacob learned how to cook. Apparently, he was quite a good chef. So he had this red lentil stew one day, and Esau had been out hunting, and he was famished. And so he came in, and he was starving, and he asked Jacob for food, the red stuff, which is the word Edom, the reddish stuff. And uh, Jacob said, well, I will give you some, but you have to sell me your birthright. And Esau says, I'm, st I'm dying. I'm hungry. I'm, st I'm starving to death. What do I care? Fine. And so he kind of flippantly sells Jacob his birthright. And then later on, Jacob is going to trick his now blind father, Isaac, into giving him the blessing for the firstborn with the help of his mother. So if you haven't read those stories, they are fascinating. Uh, there's some, and then nobody ever makes a movie out of these. I'm telling you, Hollywood is all focused on the wrong stuff. They, these are much more fascinating stories. So Jacob and Esau, but... Really, uh, there are plenty of scholars that hypothesize that the, the tension in the relationship that we read about between Esau and Jacob is actually a metaphor for the ongoing tension between Edom and Israel. And we're going to see kind of why that is 
when we get into the text. So again, Edom is a neighboring country. There is lots of tension and dispute over land. At one point, Judah kind of makes Edom a little bit of a vassal state. Um, and then Edom, of course, in, uh, rebels. Edom will also assist the Babylonians and causing the harm to the temple and to Jerusalem. So there are plenty of reasons why the Israelites are unhappy with Edom and why the Edomites are unhappy with the Israelites. Uh, of course, some of our most vicious uh, fights and ongoing disputes tend to be with people that we are related to. So unfortunately, they're carrying on that tradition. So let's jump into the text. Uh, hopefully this background will give us a little bit of context for what we're going to read. And it's going to start at verse 1 with the vision of Obadiah. So already the text is setting us up to let us know that this is something that the prophet sees. Now, whether he sees it in a dream, whether it's something that only he can see that God opens his eyes to or not, we don't have that level of detail. All we know is that there is something that he is able to, there's a visual component, he can see it, whether it's in his mind or, or with his actual eyes, but there's a visual component to this message from God. And it starts off with our prophetic utterance, thus says the Lord, God in this case. Uh, usually it says at least thus says the Lord. But here you'll notice it's not just using the capital L, small caps, O-R-D, which stands for Yahweh, the personal name of God the Father. But here we have the actual title, Master God. This is our God as the prime God. So thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. It's very rare that we think of our God using one of our ancestors' prophets in order to critique a foreign country, and that's really what the entire passage is going to be about. It would be as if we had um, the modern equivalent of that be a very prophetic preacher who wanted to spend all their time talking about what God was going to do to Canada. Most of us would be like, this is weird. <laughs> this is a little weird. Uh, that's, that's not typically how we think about our faith nowadays. Um, I'm sure there's somebody out there that's preaching against their neighbor, but uh, that's not how we tend to think of things. And again, we are in a post-Christ world. So we have uh, the additional books of the New Testament that shape how we think about our neighbors. And it's interesting because Jesus is going to spend how much time talking about how to interact and act toward our neighbors, and perhaps this is one of the reasons why. So uh, concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord, and now you see that capital L, small caps, O-R-D for Yahweh, and a messenger has been sent among the na nations. And the messenger is saying this, rise up, let us rise against it for battle. So this is asking, it's kind of the call to arms against Edom, it's calling for battle. I will surely make you least among the nations. So God is declaring this as the prophecy for Edom. You shall be utterly despised. Your proud heart has deceived you. You that live in the cleft of the rock. Or some of you might have a translation that say the clefts of Selah, which is actually a geographical area there in uh, what was Seir that becomes known as Edom. Your dwelling is in the heights. You say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. So their topography of Edom is elevated. In fact, this is exactly why David chose Jerusalem for his city, because it was very defendable. It was up on a mount kind of a plateaued mount. And Edom has lots of hills where the people live atop of that. They feel safer there because it's a lot harder to attack up a mountain than it is to repel someone who is climbing from above. And so they are saying that in the text that they feel both arrogant and they feel safe because of where they physically are. Meanwhile, it's what's in their hearts that has caused them to fall. They think that because they live up here, that they're untouchable. And God says, oh, no, you know, first of all, I live up here. <laughs> and there's nothing that I cannot do. So who's going to bring you down? And notice that there's some of the same language that we hear in other prophetic books or that we hear. A prophet Isaiah likes to use the metaphor of soaring. 
with the eagle, you will mount up with wings like eagles. So we hear that language here. Your nest is among the stars. There's certainly a lot of language about the stars, both in Isaiah and certainly all the way back in Genesis. So we're hearing some of the same language, but it's being kind of turned on its head. You know, you think you soar, but God soars higher. And usually eagles soar up and then they swoop down on their prey. But if the eagle is here, there is someone who is capable of bringing the eagle down. The eagle is not at the top of this food chain. And the same with the stars. You think because you sleep so much higher that everyone else is beneath you. But no, says God, I am still above. And from there, I will bring you down, says the Lord. So hopefully you have a break in your text, kind of like a breather. And then we're going to pick up at verse 5. If thieves came to you, if plunderers by night, how you have been destroyed... Would they not steal only what they wanted? If great gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? Um, So what, what we're kind of seeing here is this vision of when people come, they don't usually clear out everything. They leave something, right? So if a thief were going to come in the night, they would only take what was valuable. They wouldn't destroy everything. And if... Uh, the grape gatherers were coming. They don't clear everything. The gleaning is what is left afterwards so that those that need food are able to come and pick what's left over for themselves or gather what has fallen onto the ground. And so there was actually a prohibition in Israel in the commandments of actually taking everything. You were meant to leave something so that people who were hungry, who didn't have an income or who didn't have a way to feed themselves and their families otherwise could do that work and still bring home food and have the means by which to support themselves. So it wasn't meant to have enough food so that they could, you know, take what you had left over and sell it, but that so that they would have a way of eating and feeding their families. But here what we're finding out is that there seems to be an indictment against the way Edom has continually plundered, actually let me finish this here so it makes sense, Um, plundered Israel, um, they help to support. They will help uh, historically to support Babylon when they come in, which leads, of course, to the suffering of the Babylonian exile. And they are also accused of being part of those who actually set fire to Israel. Um, I mean, to Jerusalem, and because the temple will be utterly destroyed at that point, completely destroyed. Uh, this seems to be a foreshadowing of that event that one of the most high and holy places in all of the promised land is going to be destroyed and Edom is going to have a hand in that. Not that Babylon wasn't perfectly capable of destroying it on their own, but having the the sibling nation of Edom participate is almost like just pouring lemon juice on a wound. And so that's the direction from which the text is coming that the plunderers would leave something, the great gatherers would leave the gleanings. Verse 6 says, How Esau has been pillaged, his treasures searched out. All your allies have deceived you. They have driven you to the border. Your confederates have prevailed against you. Those who ate your bread have set a trap for you. There is no understanding of it. So while Edom thought that it was going to save itself at the expense of Israel by allying with Babylon... Ultimately, Babylon is also going to be destroying Edom. So it's not going to work out for them in the long run. But this is a play that repeatedly happens, not just in the Bible and not just historically, but this is something that we still see, both on a micro level in human relationships and on a macro level in in national affairs. That sometimes you try to pick the ally that you think will be best for you in the long run, even if it causes strife with other relationships that you have. And so Edom was kind of gambling by trying to choose Babylon, who seemed to be the world power at the time, and so therefore they were the better bet. But ultimately, Edom forgets that Israel has the Lord. And that's what you're hearing here, is the Lord says, you're not going to get away with this. What you have done and what you will do, I have seen, and there will be consequences for that. So it's going to continue on at verse 8. It says, on that day, which we've heard previously in the minor prophetic books, on that day, which is generally considered to be the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the day of reckoning, that that day I will destroy the wise out of Edom and the understanding out of Mount Esau. So again, you're seeing that, that reference here to their ancestor Esau. Your warriors shall be shadowed, O Taman, so that everyone from Mount Esau will be cut off. 
for the slaughter and violence done to your brother Jacob. So here it is recalling for us the sibling relationship between these two. Shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aside, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, so that would uh, be a perfect foreshadowing of the pillaging, um, the, the siege and pillaging, and ultimately the, t the taking into exile that happens from Babylon. Uh, it says that this happens here for Israel, that you stood aside while strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem. You too were like one of them. So this part of the scripture tends to look at all of the nations that are around here as kind of being like a community. And if you think of like a little town where everybody has their homesteads kind of near each other, they may not all get along, but they're all part of this same little community here. And of course, Edom has a, a significant tie to the people of Israel in the genealogical story that we get about Jacob and Esau. And this text seems to imply that the closeness, the relationship that should have been, even though it was never a beautiful relationship between the two, just like it was never really a beautiful relationship between Jacob and Esau, that this should have counted for something. But instead, strangers who come from way up here, Edom will join with them rather than saying, you know, I may not like you, we may not always agree, but you are my neighbor and I will stand with you rather than betray you. And so what ends up happening is when Edom allies with Babylon and helps to lay siege to Jerusalem and then set fire to it, they are kind of stabbing their sister nation in the back. That's kind of the, the imagery that we get here, the betrayal. You know, you were of us. The, the lineage, the, um, the understanding of who the Babylonians are in no way, shape, or form relates to these people. And of course, there's, there's an origin story for Moab that ties in with Lot's daughters as well. So there's kind of genealogical stories that the people of Israel understood a, a connection, kind of a profound lineage and genealogical connection to these nations that surrounded it versus the nations that will end up coming from outside of the area that end up doing such harm, not just to... Israel or Judah or the people of Israel, but also these other nations. And this is just one of the instances where God says, I have seen what you have done. Babylon was the main perpetrator, but you are an accessory. You have participated and enabled their crimes even more. So verse 12 says, but you should not have gloated over your brother on the day of his misfortune. So not only did they participate, but then they added the insult to injury by enjoying the suffering of God's people. It says, um, you should not have boasted on the day of their distress, which of course, this is synonymous parallelism. It's kind of a, a reframing of the, of the preceding verse. So you should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah is another way of, oh, on the day of their ruin is another way of saying you should not have boasted on the day of their distress. This is um, a literary uh, piece that we see repeatedly in the Psalms, this synonymous parallelism. parallelism. Verse 13 says, you should not have entered the gate of my people on the day of their calamity. Of course, and that's referring to entering into the gates of Jerusalem after the siege and kind of being part of the conquering army entering in there. Uh, over, you should not have been joined in the gloating over Judah's disaster on the day of his calamity. You should not have looted his goods on the day of his calamity. You should not have stood at the crossings to cut off his fugitives. You should not have handed over his survivors on the day of distress. So here you can just see the painful things that Edom helped to perpetuate. It's bad enough that Judah is overtaken by Babylon. It's bad enough that they lose the battle in the siege of Jerusalem. It's bad enough that Babylon will destroy their holy temple. But then to have your neighbor participate and point out the people that are fleeing, hey, you should get them too because they're part of Judah, um, is just a, an atrocity on top of the suffering. Verse 15 is going to begin with, for the day of the Lord is near against all the nations. So now we're kind of expanding this boundary, expanding who is going to have to have the reckoning. It's not just Edom. 
all the nations, as you have done, it shall be done to you. Now, of course, Jesus is going to say something very similar, remember, as you forgive, so shall you be forgiven. And, um, and that, of course, is in part of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus will teach to us to pray. But it's the inverse, right? The idea is that if you want to be forgiven, then you should forgive. If you want good things to happen to you, then you should be good to others. But here it's saying, because you have caused pain and suffering, so it shall happen to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so they participated in the, the revelry, the post-siege and slaughter revelry here on this holy ground, as you have drunk on my holy mountain, all nations you, around you shall drink. They shall drink and gulp down and shall be as though they had never been. But on Mount Zion, there shall be those that escape and it shall be holy. So repeatedly in the prophetic books, we get what we call the remnant, this small group that's going to survive, that's going to be where redemption will come forth or arise. And even now it's saying, you know, you thought you helped Babylon destroy everything, but I will have those that will survive and I will rebuild my holy city, Mount Zion, uh, also known as Jerusalem, and it shall once more be holy for war and the spilling of blood and the destruction of the temple and the trampling of an unclean people in that area would profane it. But God is saying, I shall once more consecrate it and restore its holy structure. And the house of Jacob shall take possession of those who disposed them. So not only am I going to rebuild what was destroyed here, but they will eventually conquer you as well. And it certainly does, there comes a time where Judah will expand further into Edom and kind of take over this area here and so, as, make it part of their subjects. So verse, nine, uh, verse 18 says, The house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, the house of Esau, Stubble. So now we're starting to see not just some of the names here that we're seeing. So we've got reference to Jacob, and Esau will come in just a few. But then you get the house of Joseph, and Joseph is one of Israel's sons, one of Jacob's sons. And of course, it's the beloved son. That's why there's this entire story about what happens to Joseph being betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, imprisoned in Egypt, eventually overcoming that and rising to be the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. So it's foretelling and kind of going, it's using the stories that have come before and foretelling that even though it seems hopeless for Joseph, Joseph triumphed. And even though it seems hopeless for my people now, they will triumph over you. And so if Jacob is going to become the fire, then what's going to be burnt and left and, and made into stubble will be the people of Esau. They shall burn them and consume them. There shall be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negeb shall possess Mount Esau, and those of Shephelah, the land of the Philistines, they shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria. So, oh, let me go back here. So these neighboring nations, Philistia is this way, these neighboring nations are going to kind of come in and conquer what had been theirs. So those of the Negeb are going to possess Mount Esau and Cephala, the, the land of the Philistines, and the land of Ephraim. Ephraim is one of the tribes, will possess the land of Samaria. And Benjamin shall possess Gilead. Actually, Samaria is up here. Samaria and Gilead are up here. So these tribes that were down here are going to possess this land because these tribes ultimately are going to be lost when the Assyrians conquer and create social chaos up here with their conquering strategy. Uh, the exiles of the Israelites who are in Hala or, um, or saying have been taken up by the army up to Babylon, those shall possess Phoenicia as far as Zephareth, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the towns of the Negev. So those who were taken away will be brought back, and they will once more take possession. And those who have been saved shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. 
So those that have been conquered and betrayed will return to the land. They will not only get the land back, but they will get other pieces of land that they had not previously had. And God says, I will do all of this as a way of helping my people be restored. Not just restored, but compensated for the suffering that happens. What's intriguing about this is that it's saying that Edom's participation in the, in the conquering and the overrunning of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple is cause for Edom to ultimately be destroyed. And of course, the country of Edom does not exist uh, in our current context. However, the nation of Israel has been reestablished. And the, the fact is that if you continue to read the prophetic books, we know, because the prophetic books tell us, that the Babylonian exile happens because of the sins of God's people. God, allow, you know, the text portrays it that God allows that to happen because their their waywardness, their worshiping of other deities, their forsaking God's commandments, and their relationship with God has gotten so bad that Babylon kind of provides this horrific timeout for them to reset and rethink, which ultimately does happen. The seven, 70 years of the Babylonian exile allow them to reformulate not only their theology, but how they think about celebrating and practicing their religious faith, and ultimately it solidifies their identity, which is what leads us up into the arrival of the Christ child. So we're kind of ignoring that, that Judah plays a role in, in, as being a catalyst for the arrival of the Babylonians, literally and theologically, literally, <laughs> when an emissary from Babylon comes to tour the capital, the king at the time decides to uh, be arrogant and prideful and display all his wealth. You never want to show everybody where all your secrets and your wealth are. And he does that, not only dis displays everything in the palace, but takes the emissary next door and shows the splendor of the temple. And so when the emissary returns back to Babylon, says, you know, there's a little place I visited down here that doesn't seem like much, but they've got something that you're going to want. And so Babylon will come back and will end up taking everything that they had seen. So there's, there's that literal piece there, but there's also the, the theological piece of the people have become very arrogant, just like the monarch. And they are relying on other gods. They are relying on their own strength. They have forsaken the Lord. And so that is the theological catalyst for the arrival of the Babylonians. And Edom just decides... We're going to get on that bandwagon. That sounds like a good one to be on. And unfortunately, this means that it's going to forever destroy any hope of, of them finding some kind of peaceful resolution to their, their neighboring disputes. So arguing with your neighbor is a very biblical thing, but it is not a holy thing. There's a difference between something being done in the Bible and something being the will of God. The arguing between these two neighbors is, is, was a reality, a painful reality, but it was not what God wanted. And unfortunately, they not only fed into that, but they allowed it to fester and ultimately ended in Edom betraying their sibling nation with the arrival of Babylon. And so the text just kind of ends. <laughs> just kind of ends. Um, it's, it's an article that, uh, it's, it's not a good one, obviously. I'm sure on some level it provided some kind of comfort to these people who have been victimized and um, ultimately have their entire world turned upside down and, and some of it literally destroyed, that to see that God was paying attention because when it becomes apparent that Babylon was aided by Edom, the, the people that are left here after Babylon comes in and takes the upper echelon of society back to Babylon for the exile, the people that are left are just trying to make sense of what is happening. So if the text was written in 900, as some scholars suspect, almost um, 300 years before the Babylonian exile, then it really is kind of setting up for this long-standing relationship and the, the instigation that Edom participates in repeatedly in that time to end with the Babylonian exile, Edom's participation, and then God bringing down justice for what Edom does. However, if the text is written sometime in the time uh, right around the Babylonian exile, then it's possible that the text is functioning more as the people finding a way to articulate their, their betrayal and what they hope God will be able to do for them. 
so there's really no definitive answer. Hopefully, in the kingdom to come, these are questions that we'll be able to ask God. God's going to have a lot of time to answer all of our questions. So hopefully that will be a piece of that. But this is the shortest book. You can kind of see why people might skip over it. However, there are a lot of things to be gained. There are a lot, there are a lot of references here to not only previous books, in the Old Testament, but also books that are going to be coming in the subsequent days in the Old Testament, as well as things in the New Testament. We can find um, little elements that will echo for us, because we have heard Christ, that will echo what we hear from Christ. And so there is perfect reason to be reading Obadiah. And hopefully this has been just a, one more opportunity for you to see some of the prophetic books. We are actually going to be reading next week Jonah, and Jonah is not a long book. These, again, remember, these are the minor prophets. All 12, of the, all 12 of these books are considered minor. Not minor in importance, but minor in length. And so Jonah is only four chapters. But Jonah is a narrative prophetic book. Unlike these prophetic books that are oracles and visions, next week when we gather together, we'll have the opportunity to begin this book. I do want to remind those of you that are watching and that are not here present with us that on the 26th of this month, I will be in North Carolina for a continuing ed event, so we will not have our Bible study that evening. So we'll see how far we get with Jonah, whether we're going to be able to get through Jonah in one night. I have done Jonah in an hour before, so it all depends on where we want to go and how we feel about it. But uh, Jonah is, is a fabulous book. I think it's one of the most impressive books in the Old Testament that doesn't get a lot of play outside of Sunday school. Sunday school, we talk about Jonah, he was eaten by a whale, yeah. Uh, but there's a lot going on in that text. And um, ironically, of all the prophets in the Bible, Jonah, who is a very unhappy prophet, unhappy with his, with his mantle and his role, is actually the most successful prophet of the entire Bible. And so we'll have an opportunity to see that. But that's really it for Obadiah tonight. So we're probably going to wrap up a little early, unless anybody has any questions. Do you all have any questions? Yes. Why are you going to Jonah instead of Michael? Because Jonah is next. Yeah, the question was, why not Micah? Jonah comes before Micah. In your Bible, do you have Micah next? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say, that's the problem with the minor prophets, is that you, you get you know, just a couple pages stuck together, and you're in a whole new book, which happens with some of the small epistles in the New Testament. But the next one in our order will be Jonah, and then we will get to Micah. Micah has fantastic readings about justice. We will get to Micah. That's one of my favorite ones. Everyone's my favorite in some way. I don't, it's terrible. when I'm like, this is one of my favorites. Like, of all 66 books, this is one of my 66 favorites. Yeah. I don't really have a book that I don't like. I like something about every book. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that we're challenged to do is try to find something that we can take away from all of these books because people have really moved heaven and earth to try to preserve them for us. And it's important to figure out why. Why do we have these texts? Of all the holy writings that have been written, and there have been much more than what we have in our canon, why were these the ones that were preserved? Uh, I think that God has allowed us to preserve Obadiah, even though it is very short and might feel inconsequential to a great number of people, because it speaks about our neighbors. And it's one thing to hear Obadiah, but then as Christians, when Jesus reframes for us how we interact with our neighbor, then Obadiah has a completely different tenor. And I, I think that that's one of the, the gifts of reading a text for how it was written and then being able to come back with the lens of Jesus Christ and read it again and see that Christ is giving us a whole new perspective. Because these were a people, as you can hear in the text, and of course when we studied the Psalms, you can certainly hear it in the Psalms, these were a people that felt justified in not only hating their neighbor, but hoping that God would destroy their neighbor. <laughs> God, I hope that you will make them feel as bad as I feel and maybe a little bit worse. I, that is kind of the refrain of the Psalms in many ways. But Jesus comes back and says, no, you shall love your God with all that you are, and you will love your neighbor as you love yourself. How am I supposed to love these people? You know what these people did? Jesus, don't you remember these people? And Jesus is like, yeah, I know those people very well. <laughs> You're still going to love them. And hopefully, they'll hear the message and they'll learn to love you too. And I think that's the challenge for us, right? Sometimes we think it's just us. We're selflessly trying to love these people. But no, the idea is that 
love will be reciprocated, that they will eventually learn to love as well. And if people can read this and maybe find some little kernel to think, to grasp onto, and to, to digest and let be fruitful in their lives, to go, you know what? Yes, you, you can not get along with your neighbor, but it doesn't mean that you have to actively work to destroy your neighbor. You can find a way to peacefully coexist and to share a boundary. You don't have to, find, to constantly look for ways to destroy them, and Edom will do that, and God is watching and paying attention. So that is the conclusion of Obadiah. I hope that that wasn't, well, I mean, we're a little early. I hope that wasn't too short, but it is, it is something that's very doable. If you ever have been asked to lead a devotion or read something and be like, well, I'm going to read from the shortest book in the Old Testament, and everybody will be very impressed that you're able to do that. And you'll have an opportunity to share maybe a reflection and offer an example of struggling with a neighbor. Because I'm sure all of us have had that experience, <laughs> struggling with your neighbor, whether it's the one in the pew or the one at your house, right? There's always that, that one. So before we go this evening, I'd like to take a moment and bring us together in prayer. Let's pray. Thank you, Almighty God. Thank you for your presence with us this evening, for your illumination of this sacred text that your people first heard so long ago. Thank you for using human vessels like Obadiah to share your will for your people. And thank you for those that have no name or face to us, but who heard you in the prophet and chose to not only remember and recall his words, but to write them down, to preserve them, so that we who are here today can look back and find your truth still pertinent for us. May our lives be the next prophetic text that is given to this world, where we live out your grace and your love, and most importantly, when thinking about our neighbors, your forgiveness. Help us to do better than Jacob and Esau did to one another. Help us to be more profound in our desire to peacefully coexist with our neighbors than Israel and Edom did. May we be a people who have seen and heard and now go forth into our lives to do our very best, to not repeat the sins of the past, but to live as rejuvenated and restored people and redeem what happens in the future. Thanks be to you, almighty God, for bringing us together. May you keep us safe and send us back into the world, into our homes, and bring us back together again once more for joyful anticipation of what the next holy text we read will say and do for us. For all this and so much more, we honor and worship you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us and look forward to seeing you next week with the prophet Jonah. Have a great night.